Rich. So uh, that's where you can find my latest writings. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, trigger warnings, and I was asked to talk about this, and I was glad because they are starting to get a lot of mainstream coverage lately. You see a lot of people sharing all these articles, you know, trigger warnings and free speech, and we're coddling college students too much, and you know, people are taking offense to a whole new extreme and a whole new level. And um, a lot of those articles are written by journalists without much of an understanding of the history behind the word trigger, the word warning, and how those warnings are actually used. Um, and it's something that's always been of interest to me because I, when people ask me where I'm from and why I talk the way that I do, I tell them I'm from the internet. <laughs> that is really where I grew up. You know, my, um, for those of you who don't know, I grew up very, very Muslim and my parents didn't let me out of the house very much. So as soon as we got the internet, I used the computer all the time and I was always on forums. And that's really where I got socialized. And so the idea of warning for content is not an alien or bizarre idea for me, personally. And uh, I also grew up watching shows like Cops and stuff, and they always have viewer discretion advised at the beginning. So, you know, as a child of the 90s, as a child of the internet, these things don't seem that bizarre to me, but I feel like a lot of people are approaching this now, and a lot of journalists especially are approaching this as if it were something novel and new and scary and encroaching. And so I thought I would demystify some of the um, impulses behind trigger warnings and things like that. So there's, there's three things we really have to dissect in the conversation about this. First of all, what is a trigger in the first place? Secondly, what is a warning? You know, what does warning for one constitute? And thirdly, why should we or should we not use them? So there's three things there. As for the definition of triggers, the origin comes in from psychology and from the study of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. So originally, PTSD was diagnosed almost exclusively in soldiers. So these soldiers would fight in World War I especially. I mean, they somewhat identified it after the Civil War, but I would say after the two world wars was really when psychology and psychiatry really started to look at this uh, phenomenon. They used to call it shell shock because they originally believed it came from you know, the loud noises and explosions of the shells, and that would cause people to react badly to loud noises. So that was the first rudimentary understanding of what we now know as PTSD. We now know that PTSD can actually be triggered by any number of things. It can be triggered by a history of trauma and abuse. It can be triggered by a single traumatic incident. It can be triggered by having been startled by a loud noise as a child. So this idea that there's, you know, you have to have sufficient trauma in order to have PTSD is a myth. It's like the idea that, oh, well, there are people who aren't as happy as you are or as doing well in the world as you are, therefore you can't have depression. That's not how mental illness works. That's not how psychological conditions work. They don't conform to any one person's idea of what is rational and what is not. Um, a lot of it is linked to pattern recognition and survival. So, you know, as human beings, Indre talked a lot about the psychological aspects that really tie into what I'm talking about. But you know, as human beings, we ra recognize patterns. We figure out, okay, when, when you figure out when you're a baby, to some extent, probably not completely consciously, that if I cry, these big people who can take care of me will come take care of me. And so that's a pattern that emerges. And that continues on and on and builds up more and more as we get older. And it's a survival tactic. You know, people who come out of abusive relationships, for example, learn that. You know, if they're not happy, they can just paste a smile on their faces and you know, people will leave them alone. Things like that. It's also, uh, part, of, part of what plays into it is stress response. So our responses to stress as human beings are not rational. You know, the stresses that we face today are nothing like the stresses we faced you know, back on the African savanna way back when, and yet we react to them like they are. We react to someone yelling at us as if they were a cheetah that we have to run from. And this stress response is something that we cannot control for the most part. We can deal with the effects of it, but we cannot stop it from happening. And stress contributes a great deal to uh, all kinds of things. Uh, aging, one of the number one factors to bad aging is stress. Um, additionally, it contributes to things like you know, immune system uh, deficiencies. So if you're more stressed, you tend to get more sick, which in turn makes you more stressed, which in turn makes you more sick. Gosh, the human condition, right? <laughs> not, not to stereotype myself as a miserable atheist here or anything like that. I'm pretty sure that any religious person here would have a field day with me, like, oh, so you atheists believe in human misery. Are you a nihilist? <laughs> but, you know, 
th that's the reality, though. The reality is that stress is something we can't 100% control, although there are ways to mitigate it and mitigate the effects of it. And so, you know, we can't logically control everything. Um, also, Indri talked about how um, our memories are bad records of the past. <clears throat> All right, there we go. <laughs> I was inadvertently controlling the computer. Um, so, you know, as Indra brought up, memory is an imperfect record of the past, and it often changes with retelling. Um, in addition, we often respond irrationally to things. That's just part of the human condition. And we all have bias. You know, I am most suspicious of anybody who says, I have an unbiased opinion. That is your big red flag, go, oh, this person doesn't even know they have biases. What biases am I going to find today? And, uh, you know, so actually, as an ex-Muslim who speaks about Islam, I come up against this a lot. People want to present me as the less biased opinion about Islam, and I say, actually, I have a hell of a lot of bias. You know, I, I left this religion for a reason, right? So that's my bias. Sure, my bias is not I'm trying to convert you or I'm trying to make you hate Muslims for irrational reasons, cough, cough, a certain overly bronzed candidate. But, you know, that's, that's, I have a different sort of bias. And so it's very important to recognize that. You really can't expect people to behave in a way that appears rational or logical to you or anyone else. You know, they have their reasons for acting the way that they do. Um, and it goes into the fundamental attribution error which is you know, a fallacy where we judge ourselves by our own motivations, and even if we act badly, we say, well, I had my reasons. You know, the reason I lashed out at that poor cashier is because I had a really hard day. But as far as that cashier and probably everyone else in line knows, you're just an asshole. <laughs> you know, you're just someone that views cashiers as inferior to you and you're taking it out on them. And there is some truth in that. Because all of us have probably lashed out at someone in the service industry in the past, even those of us who have worked in it, and we can get away with lashing out at people like that. You can't lash out at your boss and get away with it, even if your boss is the source of your stress, but you can sure as heck take it out on a cashier, and they have to smile and tell you to have a nice day, whether they like it or not. And then they submit the story to Not Always Right, which, by the way, is a fantastic website. <laughs> if you work in the service industry, it's very gratifying to read. So, and we also have a lot of self-justification going on. You know, another thing that injury talked about, you stole my thunder about part one. No. But you know, she actually is a researcher in that field, so you know, much, much gratification for me for that. But you know, we all think we have good reasons and often rational reasons for the things that we do. But we don't. You know, we really, really don't. And so that extends to uh, the understanding of PTSD, because one of the big criticisms that has come up lately with people who don't understand is that, oh, it's ridiculous that you get PTSD from anything but war, and that it's an insult somehow to soldiers that somebody could have PTSD from anything but straight on war. And that is a myth, and that is completely unscientific. And on top of that, you know, I, I live in Southern California. My first kiss was with, with a Marine once upon a time. And so I've known a lot of people in the military because, you know, the bases are out there in Southern California. And some of these guys have never seen combat. They sat in a room and pushed some buttons, and I'm not devaluing what they did or, you know, what impact it could have on them. But the idea that only people in the military can have PTSD is a complete fallacy. And everyone in the military doesn't experience it either because they react differently to different things. Um, so that brings us to the idea of a trigger. So there's one physical definition, right, which is the trigger of a gun. But in the psychological sense, in the PTSD sense, a trigger is basically something that causes somebody to react as if they were in the traumatic situation that set off their PTSD. So may, it could be something like someone treating them or using a phrase. I'll give an example, a more specific example, even though obviously it's not limited to this. This is just what my familiarity is with. And, you know, there are people who were in abusive relationships where the person used a certain phrase to devalue and dehumanize them and to control them. And maybe that phrase comes up with someone who looks like the person that used to say stuff like that to them. And they mentally react in such a way as if they were in that traumatic situation again. 
And uh, experiencing that trigger is different for everyone um, who has PTSD, but often it involves some level of shutting down mentally. Or, you know, the stereotype is, you know, they curl up into a ball and cry, but they may, you know, try to reassure the other person, they may try to get out of the situation. It, they're in some way impaired by that experience. And while loose definition of triggers are not useful for respecting real PTSD triggers, uh, they can be good for at least understanding to some extent what a trigger can feel like. Um, you know, it's, it's very unlikely that you at some point have not experienced something similar to a trigger in the sense that a situation or an individual reminded you of something that was bad in your past and you reacted as if that was done. Um, scent is a huge thing, you know, positive and negative. Um, realtors bake cookies in the houses that they sell because, you know, it's supposed to make you think of home and grandma. Even though that's not your grandma, that's someone who's trying to take your money. <laughs> and the same thing can apply to perfumes. I remember I, when I started high school, I kept, there's this girl and I didn't know her, and she, but she would pass by me very often. And, you know, Southern California, so it's warm, so you can really smell if someone's wearing a scent. And I just developed a distaste for her and I didn't understand why. And then we were put together in a, in a in theater class, and she turned out to be a really nice person. And then it hit me. She wore the same cotton candy perfume that that middle school bully I hated wore. And so somehow she had become her, and I hated her. But you know, once I got to know her, she was fine. So I'm not saying that that was a PTSD trigger for me, because I do not have a PTSD diagnosis, but it's true for all of us that we associate things with each other. And PTSD just takes it to another level. So that sort of covers the idea of triggers. As for warning for them, we have to understand that labeling is not by definition censorship. You know, just putting a label on something does not mean that you are stopping it in any way. At the same time, labeling and establishing a system of labeling can be a way to perpetuate control. And the biggest example of this in American society today, or one of the most I guess people take this example for granted, is the MPAA, the Motion Picture Advisory Association. The movie rating system is more arbitrary than you can ever believe. There is no consistency, there is no single standard, it's literally just a bunch of people, they wrangle together and they sit around and say, well, I think this movie should get a PG or PG-13. And the um, Ruby rating system is actually a fairly new thing as well. You know, it's only been around, it's not been allowed around for as long as the movie industry has been around. And so you see the biases of those people within the MPAA reflected in the way that ratings are done. Because we think of it as, oh, you know, if they say the F word a certain number of times, or oh, if they show this many seconds of genitalia, then they must get this rating. But it's actually quite inconsistently applied in a way that really reflects our societal norms. And my favorite example of this um, is, warning, I'm gonna talk about sex now. You can cover your ears if you want. I won't blame you. Um, oral sex. Many, many, many movies that have R or even PG-13 ratings invoke fellatio in some way. I mean, we had a joke with Tommy yesterday that kind of invoked fellatio, right? But, um, you know, they, uh, there's a lot of movies that show implied or even sometimes fairly explicit fellatio, especially on the part of a woman on a man. You know, that's, that passes by, they're like, whatever, it's not a big deal. However, cunnilingus, think about the last time you saw a movie that involved cunnilingus that wasn't on Pornhub or YouPorn or RedTube. You know, it's, it's not very often. Blue Valentine actually ran into this trouble, and Brian Gosling, who was in the movie, spoke out about this, and he said, you know, they had to really censor and cut out the cunnilingus scene because the censor considered that too explicit. Even though, you know, no genitalia was shown, it was just him underneath the covers doing his thing and her enjoying it. Um, the same thing applies to Boys Don't Cry, which was a movie that came out a while back. Um, the, there was a scene that involved cunnilingus, and you know, you didn't really see it, but the character who performed cunnilingus jerked his head out and wiped his chin, and that was considered to be too explicit. You know, so, you know, a, depicting a woman, you know, wiping her mouth or swallowing after fellatio is, is bad, but you know, 
A guy wiping his chin after giving his girlfriend pleasure. That's horrible. And what about the children? <laughs> so it really reflects the societal bias. Um, the same goes for heterosexual versus less heterosexual interactions. You know, a movie with one kiss between two women or two men will be slapped with a much higher rating than a movie that is basically a saliva swapping fest. I'm looking at you, Princess Diaries. This is a movie came out a long time ago, and it's not worth watching, so don't go and watch it for this reason. But it has a G rating, and it was a Disney production, and I remember watching it as a middle schooler. And granted, I was a very prudish middle schooler. I was a Muslim in a headscarf. But I went to see this movie, and there was so much saliva swapping. Everybody was making out with each other at every turn. And I, and I kept wondering, why does this have a G rating? There's so much. And not just chase little kisses, like making out, like eating each other's faces, like Anakin and Padme in episode two of Star Wars, like that disgusting, just om nom nom. You know, is this cannibalism? I feel like cannibalism should get a higher FBA rating. So, you know, there, that's another way that it reflects sort of the societal bias towards one thing versus another. Um, another example of a way that sort of society's values are reflected in the way that we warn for certain content, I discovered on, all, uh, on of all things NPR. So I did not grow up with the concept of Santa. I mean, I knew about Santa, but I was that asshole kindergartner who told all their classmates about how Santa wasn't real and that their parents were lying to them. I mean, I was a Muslim kid. I felt kind of left out in some ways, you know? And in, in a way, the way I felt left out is why I have such a problem with the concept of Santa. Because if you teach your kids Santa is real, you're teaching them that some white guy gives presents to all the white kids, but all the Hindu kids and the Muslim kids, ah, he doesn't care about them. So, you know, that, that was kind of my thing. Um, plus, I, I very much believed in the truth, and I very much believed in not lying. And so the idea that all my classmates' parents were engaged in a vast conspiracy against them to make them believe something that wasn't real morally offended me. And so I told them that Santa wasn't real. But as an adult, I was listening to NPR, I think it was last Christmas season, and they said, those of us with younger viewers should tune out because we're talking about Santa. And I remember thinking, that's a warning, right? That's a warning for parents who listen to NPR in the morning with their kids, and they don't want their kids to be spoiled about Santa. But that's a warning that reflects societal values. I don't care. Why would I care? My parents wouldn't care if I overheard it. But because mainstream society has this idea that we need to trick kids into believing it's Santa, they think it's worth warning about on mainstream radio. And really, who's letting their tiny kids listen to NPR? Wouldn't the kids just fall asleep anyway? Good, that soothing voice very close to the microphone. <laughs> this is Terry Gross. <laughs> Another example of the way that societal values are reflected in the way we have worn is with the parental advisory stickers, which for you youngins was a really big deal. <laughs> Back when uh, Timber Gore, Al Gore's wife, was really pushing for this. This idea that music albums, albums are these square things, and inside of them were these round things, but before that they were rectangular things and they would play music. And you had to go to the store and buy them. There was actually a point of access. There was actually some level of control over where you could buy things. Um, and so Tipper Gore wanted certain pieces of music to have, or certain albums, to have a warning on them um, so that parents could better control what their kids were listening to. And on top of that, um, kids weren't allowed, below a certain age, weren't allowed to buy things with the parental advisory sticker. So you'd be carded to get music. And this was a big deal at the time. It passed. It was viewed on some, by some people as paternalistic, and some people who are parents as, you know, a good thing, I guess. Not all parents, but some. But in, within that system, there, a lot of the reason why anyone even considered labeling music like that was because of the rise of hip-hop and rap. People were, had, their kids were listening to bad words and things about violence and sex and they didn't want their kids to listen to that, ignoring the fact that rock and roll has been doing this for decades now. How many rock, classic rock songs that we've all shook our heads along with on the radio, at least that's what I do, um, involve underage sex? Or get, actually more accurately, grown ass men having sex with young girls. A lot of our classic, beautiful, romantic songs are about that. 
And yet, nobody wanted to label those. No one wanted to label those to protect the ears of the precious youngins. But as soon as people of color come out with their own art form and their own version of music, suddenly everybody wants to control it and label it and warn people about it. So that reflects some biases within society as well. Now, what all these people who are perpetuating their biases through warnings have in common is not that they are people with PTSD promoting warnings about PTSD triggers. Usually people with PTSD aren't the ones in social power. They don't necessarily have the ability to control in this way. It doesn't help that in our anti-science society, there's a lot of hatred and hostility to people with psychiatric diagnoses. And we have a bias against the treatment of those too. You know, you're crazy, you're out of your mind, you're insane. That's the best way to insult someone, but at the same time, what does that reflect? It's someone with a mental disorder. Every time there's a shooting, everyone wants to blame mental health, even though people with mental health disorders and diagnoses are far more likely to be the victims of violence than to actually perpetuate violence. So the establishment as it exists, society as it exists, is biased against people with mental disorders. So the idea that someone promoting trigger warnings is part of the establishment trying to censor you is a complete misunderstanding of who's doing what. There are people on different sides of different things who are promoting different ideas. The origin of the modern trigger warning, especially online, comes from young women. And I mentioned that I'm from the internet and I'm an old hand at the internet and I've had an email address for a long time. I witnessed this firsthand. And it was mostly among young women who had eating disorders. Because having an eating disorder isn't exactly a walk in the park, you know. It's very hard, most people don't want to disclose it in person, but like many communities like that, a lot of these uh, young women with eating disorders went online and found community, and they created community. And when they would talk about certain behaviors that they had engaged in, they would warn each other, because sometimes reading about someone else doing something like that would, you know, if someone was especially in a very vulnerable or sensitive place, lead them to engage in that behavior as well. Um, and there's been some research done on that, um, especially with the pro-anorexia and pro-bulimia movements that used to be a big deal online. They've mostly been quashed, but for a long time it was a big problem. They call themselves Anna and Mia, so like a cutesy version of anorexia and bulimia, and they'd say things like, I'm pro-Anna or I'm pro-Mia. And so this was a big problem, but to differentiate between people who were pro-eating disorder, if you can imagine that, versus people who were trying to seek therapy and help for their eating disorders, trigger warnings were a huge differentiator. You know, people who were pro-eating disorder were all about triggering each other into engaging in those behaviors. But people who were actually seeking help and community and, and healing through it would warn each other about these behaviors. And that's really where it kind of started. And if the research has shown about you know, society and linguistics, young women tend to drive vocal trends. So the word like, we associate with valley girls and vocal fry, which is you know when you end your sentence like this. People associate it with young women and they, they call it annoying, and yet there have been instances of former President George W. Bush using that. And he's as far away from a young woman as you can get. <laughs> and so trigger warnings can be even seen as part of that trend, where things that young women do in social situations or things that are associated with young women go mainstream, and but not without criticism because you know, young women can't possibly have anything to contribute to society, right? Sarcasm. <laughs> Hopefully understood. And um, another kind of warning that has sort of become a thing is uh, warning for spoilers. You know, before, you know, you would watch TV and TV would air at a certain time and then you would go to work the next day and have the water cooler conversation. And now we have Netflix dropping 12 episodes of Daredevil and me rotting away on the couch in my pajamas trying to watch them all. Um, but now we have people watching media at different paces. Or people who don't want to go to the movie theater because it's really expensive. And so we warn for spoilers. And we don't warn for spoilers because they cause psychological harm in other people. We warn them because we don't want to be jerks. We don't want to be that person that tells the whole plot of all of Daredevil to the person who hasn't had the chance because of their work schedule to watch all of Daredevil. So, so why not be nice to people who have PTSD too? So to bring this back around to freedom of speech, 
To believe that freedom of speech means I get to say whatever I want, whenever and wherever I want, to whomever I want, without it having an effect that I don't want, is incredibly shallow and misguided. Freedom of speech doesn't mean I get to say whatever I want and then no one's allowed to be upset by it, no one's allowed to criticize it, no one's allowed to write a counter statement to it. It doesn't mean you just get to drop off a statement and run away. You know, many of us are held accountable for our speech. I have gone to bat for what I've said many times. I have apologized for what I've said many times. Sometimes in jest, I've said something and someone pointed out there was something wrong with it. And you know, I didn't say, well, that's my freedom of speech. You know, you have to, you have to be accountable for it. It also devalues the deep and incredible importance of speech. To say, I have free speech and that means that my speech can't affect anyone. Where, where is your understanding of history if you believe that? Speech has an effect. Speech causes revolutions. Speech moves mountains, metaphorically speaking, of course. The pen is mightier than the sword, right? You know, these ideas perpetuate themselves. Think about the traditional definition of memes. The idea that ideas can be a gen uh, almost like a form of legacy that you leave behind that's distinct from a genetic, physical legacy, but still is a part of you that's left behind in the world. It's the same idea that's behind the, the notion of people walking up to me and saying I'm brave. This happens a lot to me because I'm an out ex-Muslim. You know, under my full name, all over the internet, death threats, all that stuff. All I'm doing is talking about an idea. It's just speech, you know. I'm not grabbing a gun and shooting Islamists in, you know, Saudi Arabia. I'm not doing anything but speech. And yet that is considered a brave act by some. It's considered, you know, a foolish act by some. I'm probably going to be okay, don't worry. I'm not a world-famous novelist like Salman Rushdie or, you know, an activist politician like Ayan Hirsi They go after the big fish. I'm a small fish for now. I know, I know I'll, I'll make it the day I get a fatwa, right? <laughs> but, you know... So if you're going to argue that I'm brave, you have to admit that speech is important. And the idea that it's just free speech and it, you just get to throw it around and nothing should happen, it's completely absurd on its face. And so now we get into the people who are against trigger warnings. There are many arguments against them that often reflect, again, a lack of understanding of the history of them. But I'm sure some of you are thinking of them or have read them, so they're important to address. Sometimes people think that trigger warnings are used to coddle college students. It's this idea that millennials are all just this oversensitive generation that whine too much and they just need to deal with reality. That's a complete misinterpretation of why and how trigger warnings are used by the relevant parties. Not outsiders looking in, but the people who choose to include trigger warnings and those who read them and use them. In, personally, for me, I've seen this play out many times. When I warn for a certain kind of content that I'm addressing, it doesn't actually decrease the number of people who read it. It increases it. Because people who do have traumatic histories can look at the warning and say, I've had a bad day today. I really don't want to be crying today. I will save this article for tomorrow when I'm in a better place. Or I want to make sure that you know, I haven't had a day where, you know, I'm going to be alone. Maybe just in case I read this and it really upsets me, I can at least have some sort of resources around. It, it, and it, I've been thanked many times for it. And I feel like it has really increased my ability to reach people because they're not going to be reading an article about one thing and suddenly there's some content about something that they didn't expect. You know, it, it's like watching, you know, a movie that, if a movie advertises itself as a comedy, and suddenly someone gets brutally murdered and hacked into pieces, you're probably going to have a reaction to it. You probably weren't necessarily going in there for that. Um, you know, people have a problem with false advertising, and that's basically I'm trying to avoid false advertising. And But sometimes that inadvertently happens. You know, I might be writing about one topic, and I want to bring up an example from something else. So I want people to be able to read my stuff without worrying about being surprised or something really upsetting for no reason. Well, often there is a reason, but you know, that reason may not be enough for them to, to read that particular section. Another argument that's used against uh, trigger warnings is based on a faulty understanding of what is called exposure therapy, which is a legitimate therapy 
for certain phobias and forms of PTSD. And this idea is that by repeated exposure to something, you become habituated to it and you react less powerfully to it. So people argue that, oh, we shouldn't use warnings because then people with PTSD or phobias can read or look at them, these things, more often and then they'll become less sensitive to it. The problem with that is that's not in a clinical setting. Exposure therapy is limited to a clinical setting and is done in a very particularly mindful and careful way by the treating, uh, the person who's treating the person with uh, phobias or PTSD. It's like, it's, again, this is one of those, you know, I'm feeling old cough, cough, leans on cane, but back in the day, we didn't really have vaccines against chickenpox. We would, some parents would in fact encourage their kids who had never had chickenpox to play with the kids who had chickenpox, and then they would get chickenpox. So that's sort of a haphazard way of dealing with things. Most of us here, and I hope all of us, would prefer vaccinations to that sort of thing. You know, vaccinations are great, pro -vax, right? And so the idea is that instead of just randomly getting exposed to this and hoping for the best, instead you can get a vaccination and not have to go through the experience of having chickenpox. So, you know, a clinical setting, a carefully controlled way by the right sort of medical health professional, is always superior to just randomly throwing exposure at people. And so it's a similar philosophy there. So the idea that we shouldn't warn for potentially triggering content because we can basically lay person exposure therapy people is completely fallacious and really dangerous, frankly. Then of course there's the argument that trigger warnings are censorship, which again, you know, the people who are promoting trigger warnings are hardly part of the establishment trying to shut people up. They're just trying to be able to access the world in a way that can be done more thoughtfully and more mindfully. Another argument that's used against it is that we cannot account for all triggers. So the argument goes, well, what if this is a trigger and this is not a trigger, and I didn't know that, and if I do some triggers, then I can't do them all, then someone might be triggered or something like that. Um, and the problem with that is that very rarely do we believe that imperfect measures are not worth doing. Wearing your seatbelt does not prevent you from dying in a car accident, but it sure as heck helps. And so just because an imperfect measure exists and in all of its glorious imperfection, doesn't mean that it should be completely dismissed out of hand. All it means is that we can work on it. We can become better at it. We can do better at it. We can figure out systems. We can put our heads together. You know, we can increase the amount of help that we give and the kindness that we show. Then of course there's the word trigger itself, which is associated with guns. And so I've had people say, well, what if somebody experience trauma because of gun violence and the word trigger is a problem for them. It's very simple, we can just use another word. And what a lot of people often use and something that I personally use is content notice instead of trigger warning. It's just, you know, just a quick warning, you know, just a quick heads up, or even just you can say, hey, heads up, like, I'm gonna talk about this really horrible thing that happened to me that involves, you know, knives or guns or whatever. So, you know, just a heads up. You can always, even use that casual language. Then there's the argument that a content notice or trigger warning could be a spoiler. So people write up these lists of content notices or trigger warnings for a particular show or movie or whatever, and people say, oh, well, if I read those, I'm spoiled. The answer to that is just, if it says content notice, just skip that line. Don't read the content notice if you really do not want to read it. You know, I, I doubt that someone is forcing you to read it. And the big argument, the one that you see all over mainstream media coverage of trigger warnings and content notices and so on, is that they go too far. I have yet to find a single person who can give me a concrete example of what going too far actually means. I would really like to know what they mean. And I, I ask in good faith, because as a former Muslim, I am pretty sensitive to this sort of thing. You know, people come at me saying, just by existing as an ex-Muslim who speaks about Islam, I'm hateful of Muslims, and they want, they have a, a, an interest in actually suppressing my ability to express myself, my actual free speech. But you have to really look at these situations and see what they mean by too far. Often what happens is it's a theoretical or a hypothetical. It's, well, if we warn for these things, 
and people excuse themselves from reading those things or looking at those things, then nobody will ever be exposed to ideas that accept them or upset them. Or this potential idea that, oh, these college students are just going to isolate themselves away from anything that's challenging them. The problem with that reasoning is that people do that anyway. They're doing it right now. And I know this is hard to swallow for most of us in the atheist crowd, but STEM majors are far less likely to challenge and change their beliefs while going through college or university than humanities majors. So STEM means science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Most of the content that you learn doing those majors does not challenge your worldview very much, even biology. And I know that's hard to believe, but again, you know, come from a Muslim background. So many Muslim doctors, right? There are many Muslim doctors and biological researchers, and learning about evolution didn't do anything to change their faith. So the fact remains that most people who go through undergraduate in the humanities are going to challenge and question their beliefs more. And most of the call for content or trigger notices comes from the humanities as well. So we shouldn't really be too worried about the isolation of humanities majors. Really, we should be thinking about the STEM majors. You know, why aren't they cha being challenged more? Why aren't they changing their ideas more through university or college? Also, a lot of the stories, of the examples that of uh, warnings gone too far, often the title is clickbait. And I don't necessarily blame writers for clickbait. I've been accused of it, and I embrace it wholeheartedly. We do clickbait because you click on it. If I write a well-reasoned, well-measured, completely neutral title, who is going to read it with all the proliferation of content out there? Sure, I might exaggerate and fluff up a little with certain of my titles, but you, know, you get the nuance in the piece itself. And so clickbait exists because we have created it. So that's part of what leads people to feel that way about stories. They read the clickbait title, they let that title influence the content, and then they walk away with a certain impression. Additionally, always keep in mind that the writer isn't always at fault for the clickbait title. It's often the editor, and or the owner of the website who wants as many clicks as possible to get as much advertising revenue as possible. And I can't necessarily say I blame them. It's really, really hard to make any sort of money on writing online and sometimes you make just enough money to cover your server costs. And that's a hidden truth of writing online, is people really get angry about advertising, they get mad about clickbait, and yet nobody wants to pay for this service that people are offering you. Because they are already paying server costs, they are already paying hosting costs, they are already putting their time and their effort and their sweat and their blood and their tears and their research into it, and all they want is for you to maybe see an ad so that they get enough money to cover their server costs. But we all get angry about that. So keep that in mind. So that's my little pitch for please stop using Adblock on sites that you like the writing on. Like use Adblock if you want on those horrible scammy sites, but if you like where somewhere you're reading something and you read them off and turn off your ad blocker just for them so that maybe they can get something back. And so like I mentioned before, you know, as an ex Muslim, I am fairly sensitive to the idea that people will use their personal offense and their outrage to censor. That is a thing that happens, that is a thing that is a problem. There is a term that we use that probably is a talk in and of itself called the regressive left. The idea that there are people on the left who think that any criticism of Islam or certain other things must be some sort of bigotry, which is really hard for, and they try to make that argument against me, but it's really hard to make because, you know, I love my Muslim family and I don't want them to go to death camps a la Trump or something like that. But, the regressive left has never needed trigger warnings to perpetuate their form of censorship. You know, over 10 years ago when I was in university, I met people who were in the regressive left who thought that it was bad that I spoke out against what happened to me when I left Islam. They didn't need the word trigger warning to go after me. Instead, they used words like bigotry. They used words like offensive. They used words like inherently hatred, hate, inherent hatred or hateful. So just because a word can be warped and misused doesn't mean that we should abandon it entirely. It means that we should push back against those who are trying to co-opt it for less than savory ends. There's also quiet behind-the-scenes censorship that most people forget about. 
We see the big splashy headlines. Speaker gets uninvited from a, a talk at a university, or you know, college promotes use of trigger warnings, and we get all up in a flurry about censorship. But the fact is, the, the is institutionalized censorship that goes on really is who gets published, invited, paid, and treated as an authority in the first place. You have people on the right promoting people like Daniel Pipes, who you know is very anti-Muslim in his views, as an expert on Islam, and people on the left promoting, you know, very, very fringe Muslims who don't even come close to representing the views of most Muslims as the authority. So there's already censorship and bias in play. It's just these big splashy examples that come up that make people think censorship. But we it's worth examining who we're looking at in the first place. Who are we completely overlooking in the in the initial worry about censorship. So why should we use content notices, trigger warnings, viewer discretion advised in the first place? As I mentioned, content warnings can invite participation and make sure that people know what they're getting into. It can invite conversation. Someone might read a content notice and read the piece and say, hey, that's not quite what I thought it was going to be, or I think you might have a misconception of what this is. It's especially, um, and it especially invites inclusion of more people. Because why do we want to exclude people with a history of trauma? People who come from marginalized and oppressed groups in society are far more likely to have experienced trauma. And you're pushing them out if you refuse to at least give them a heads up about what's going on. And those are some of the most important voices to bring awareness to what is going on. They are often the canaries in the coal mine. They're the people who are going to tell you what's wrong and what's happening. So with the, as I mentioned with my blog, you know, I use content notices and I feel like they invite more participation. Um, but one example of the way that content notices and trigger warnings can be actually quite helpful is uh, with Facebook. I have never seen a more creative use of Facebook than with my friends who actually care about content notices and trigger warnings. You know, when they allow photos to be embedded in comments, they could, their posts could be warning picture of, you know, thing that could possibly, you know, trigger someone, and then they can embed it in the comments. So there's a lot of ways that technology and technological innovation and development can be pushed by people who are, who care about signaling these things, who care about people not being triggered or, you know, otherwise being made uncomfortable in a way that they weren't expecting. So, you know, I work in tech, so maybe this is just me with my futuristic idealism. It doesn't help that I read a lot of sci-fi. But it is entirely possible that certain aspects of content notices and trigger warnings could help us develop more useful and interesting tech. But that aside, when has it ever been a terrible thing to want to include more people and be kind to people? So ultimately, that's, a, that's the argument and thought that I hope to leave you with. Thank you.